I'm not Allison Gage. <laughs> Allison Gage is our chief medical officer, and uh, she was uh, originally going to chair and moderate this panel. Um, she is very busy right now uh, running our adaptive platform trial program study for PTSD, which is uh, about to start getting rolling, and so it's a very intense time. Um, so I'm taking over for her. And, uh, and what we have is uh, a, a panel here of, of uh, I forgot what the word was earlier, uh, uh, well, uh, very successful uh, entrepreneurs, I think is the best way uh, to put this. Um, this is a remarkable group of people who have persevered um, in many cases, I, I think some uh, up to 20 plus years in some cases, to ensure that we have um, aids in diagnostics and therapeutics for the traumatic brain injury space. Um, and, um, and, and it's been really quite an amazing ride. And in the last year and a half, we've seen success and, and approvals uh, from many of these groups. And so we thought it would be a great time to convene everybody and ask the question, what did we learn? Uh, from that ride <laughs> along the way, um, and, and where are you going now? How do, how do we think about taking these lessons learned um, in this field and, and accelerating the path for the next generation of diagnostics and therapeutics that might, might come along? Obviously, in the realm of diagnostics, we've made great strides with therapeutics. Uh, we're struggling, and, and um, that's why we have this clinical trials group uh, discussion later this afternoon. So hopefully this will drive some thinking and some ideas for, for that group. Uh, we're going to start with a presentation from Michael Hoffman um, from the CDRH. And uh, Michael has been uh, just a tremendous partner uh, to uh, to us at Cohen Veterans Bioscience and the Rapid DX uh, program itself, um, very engaged in helping us understand this this crosstalk that has to happen between regulators and the field. Um, it, it has to be mutually informed process and. Um, he and his team have been fantastic. He's going to speak to us about the progress they've made in traumatic brain injury. So thank you, Magali. Um, so uh, I am Michael Hoffman. I'm the Associate Director for the Office of Neurological and Physical Medicine Devices in CDRH. And I'm just going to give you a few slides and a few pieces of information. I'm trying not to duplicate a lot of the information that Dr. Pena provided yesterday. With one exception, and that is that we do have a submission, a pre-submission process, and it's really to engage early with FDA. It is free. It's still free. We extended the sale. It's still free today. Um, but when you look at you know, this space, especially when you, as we've talked the last couple days about a lot of the unknowns, a lot of the things that are still being developed, a lot of the mechanisms that are not quite known, that's where we really like to have people come and talk to us early so that we can have a better idea and come to an understanding of how a trial should be set up, especially if you have a specific goal in mind of how you want a medical product, whether it be a diagnostic or a therapeutic, to be indicated. Because one of the key things that we're looking for in clinical testing is that there's a matchup between your indications for use and how you're actually studying the device. But taking a step back, what we're looking for when we're evaluating medical products um, for approval or clearance, we're basically looking at the benefits and risks of the products. That's the potential benefits that are being provided as well as the adverse event, the risk profile of that product. Now, when we're looking at benefits, it's not just, as has been noted here, the statistics. It's not just looking at p-values. We're looking for clinically meaningful results. That comes back to one of the patient-centered outcomes, too, that was mentioned earlier. We're looking at what the duration of treatment is. We're looking at if you can get a therapeutic, does that preclude you from other therapies that are also available? Uncertainty also gets folded into this category as well. But again, and this kind of emphasizes why we really want that pre-submission or how we, why we heavily encourage it is that when you're setting up that trial, you don't want to find out after the fact that you, it will be more difficult to actually get what you ultimately wanted because you didn't have a, a matchup of how you designed the trial to the indications that you're looking for. And a lot of this goes into the, 
the population that you're studying, including the eligibility criteria, which I think, as we've already heard, is a little difficult to always do consistently. The actual condition being evaluated, whether it's a standalone use, an adjunctive use, the duration of an effect. Something else that comes up quite a bit, especially when you're looking at therapeutics, what is your comparator? What is your control group? And I think we've heard that can be quite difficult to figure out here. That's a challenge that we've always been looking at and even outside of TBI itself. And one of the things that we're looking for is can you pre-specify an analysis plan, a statistical analysis plan? It makes it a lot easier on the, on the back end if you can point back and show that how you're analyzing the data is how you originally intended to do it. Now, a lot of these are ones we've already heard. Uh, some of the specific clinical testing concerns that we've noted from TBI, one is the lack of a gold standard just for the diagnostic criteria. What we've used, it's a clinical diagnosis, a majority consensus diagnosis, two out of three majority, or a blind expert panel. Those are the issues, that's how we have been uh, using for a diagnostic criteria of TBI in our studies. Similarly, there's a lack of a gold standard for the outcome assessment measures. And, but the one thing that we do want to make sure is that whatever change you're actually correlating is meaningful um, and that it has to do with the actual specific dis disorder uh, or condition of concern. That's not always the case. Sometimes there's difficulty picking up exactly what is being assessed in the outcome to the actual condition being treated. And so we've had in the past, some issues with trials where if they haven't come to talk to us, they'll be assessing a specific either biomarker or outcome assessment, and it's hard to tie it back to the condition that the condition and indication that's actually being assessed. So in terms of what we really need, we're looking for that clear definition of a study population, including you know, the effects known for the test performance, the criteria that are being used, the time since the injury, the physical disability, the previous injuries, et cetera, as much as that can be provided. Sometimes, you know, it's been noted, it's not always easy to get that information, but we're looking for any way to mitigate and uh, design in ways to improve getting that piece of information. Especially in this space, whatever other comorbid conditions are being considered when you're having to deal with this study population. And then there's one last thing that we wanted to just emphasize. So we've been, just a couple months, was it a couple months ago, maybe two months ago, we issued a safety notice regarding several other devices that were being marketed for either treating, managing, diagnosing concussion that didn't have a clearance. There's, in a lot of cases, but not every case, um, it was software-only devices, several apps that are being marketed to consumers, um, directly to consumers, directly to patients, um, to assess whether or not you had a concussion or whether somebody had a concussion. And I think there was a lot of confusion about whether or not these products were actually medical devices and regulated by FDA, uh, and they are, in fact. So we put together a safety notice to identify and notify consumers that these products were out there, they do not have a proper clearance, and that we've been working to address issues with them to bring them into compliance. And we basically wanted to make the public aware of that. And I think we also wanted to put not only patients uh, on notice, but also other manufacturers. If there are products making claims about assessing, diagnosing, or managing head injury, they're considered medical devices by FDA. And that includes you know, TBI, mild TBI concussion, any of those any of those words, if you're making claims like that, those are the people that need to come talk to us in order to actually market their products. And so to try and help with that, we made basically have put together a web page that identifies products that have clearances for assessing head injury. And we're basically trying to make sure that if people have questions, please come talk to us. Because we really want to make sure we're trying to put patients first. And that's what we always do, because there is a definite concern if you are giving you know, incorrect information, especially about TBI, and that information might be used to make, say, return to play decisions or return to service uh, decisions, especially if they're not being properly informed. So just quickly in conclusion, everything that we're trying to do, whether it's assessing it on the pre-market side, the post-market side, we're keeping our patients in mind, or not our patients, but your patients and all patients in mind. Um, and we understand, obviously, that's what you all are doing, too. And we're just trying to make sure we can do it as best we can collectively. So that's all I have. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. 
So obviously this is an important uh, high bar that we all need to meet and uh, what we'd like to do now is have each of the uh, teams present uh, who you are, what, who, what your organization you're representing, and a brief description of uh, the product or device that you've been developing uh, or have developed, so uh, past, past, present, or future um, uh, at this time. So, uh, Ron, would you start? Sure. Ron Hayes. I'm a founder and director of Banyan Biomarkers, Inc. Uh, some of you may know Banyan uh, received the first FDA clearance for a blood-based biomarker for acute diagnosis of traumatic or brain injury, uh, specifically to distinguish between mild versus moderate TBI. Uh, Banyan was founded in 2002, so uh, you do the numbers. It was not an, uh, a, a rapid or uh, uh, inexpensive journey. I tell people now, I think I've told Magali, who uh, has to suffer through some of my mentorship, uh, <laughs> that you, ha you, should, you need to be nurtured by your naivete when you start a company, because if you really knew what th you faced, you'd probably binge on Netflix or something more destructive. <laughs> uh, so the, the industry figures are it takes between 100 and $200 million to bring a, a, a diagnostic through the FDA. Uh, our figures uh, approximate that thanks to Dallas. Uh, we uh, benefited from uh, funding from the DOD uh, and without that support, Banyan would not have succeeded. So it, it, it's simply uh, uh, that direct. So what have we learned? Uh, I think that uh, the good news is that now that we have a predicate approval, the pathways for others will be shortened. Uh, I told Magali the other night that I'm reminded of the four minute mile by Sir Roger Bannister. He, he broke it and then he held it for the shortest period of time. So the barrier wasn't uh, a physiological one, it was a psychological one. And in many ways, by changing the zeitgeist, I think we'll prove that true for blood biomarkers. Having said that, again, it's been 50 years since uh, we walked on the moon, and there have been a lot of squandered opportunities. So I, I think the, the wonderful role uh, that CVB can play is to make sure we don't uh, reproduce uh, the feelings of the moonwalk. I have a variety of uh, very specific recommendations uh, about facilitating moving forward. Uh, uh, we can probably dwell on those in, in, in more detail. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely get to the, to right. the panel. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. And for your mentorship. <laughs> General Zanakis. Hi, my name is uh, Steve Zanakis. I'm a psychiatrist. I'm a retired Army general. And I want to thank you for putting this together. It's a very constructive conversation that we're having. And it's a credit to you uh, and to pull off your remarks, credit to Dallas and all of you who have supported these projects and developments. Um, my role is, though, uh, as a disruptor. I'm a flamethrower. And as a general, I could be your worst nightmare. And I'm going to tell you why. Uh, in 2007, uh, Admiral Mike Mullen, who was a friend of mine, we had met as one stars in the charm school, he did much better than I did. Um, <laughs> we're sitting with a group of captains at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Uh, each of us has slightly different roles. He had just been inaugurated as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. And we are listening to these young officers tell about their combat tours. And he and I both had a chilling reaction. Uh, remember that we're, uh, era, our, we're Vietnam era soldiers and sailors. We had seen what had happened coming out of that war. And we listened to, these were all young men, artillery officers, and we felt uh, we were now going to look ahead and the same movie was going to unfold. That we were going to send, as we have, 2.8 million individuals into Iraq and Afghanistan since 9-11. And they were going to come back with some injuries and conditions and illnesses that we were going to fail to treat. 
And we needed to find a way to jumpstart a support program and a treatment for these individuals. And God bless you all for the hard work you're doing. And I'm going to get on my little general officer lecture platform. You have failed. You great scientists, thoughtful people, well-meaning, well-intentioned, have failed these people. We have new biomarkers. We have no real new diagnostic tools. And we really don't have any new real treatments on the horizon. And we're still debating the same issues, which I heard from you earlier, about what is the clinical issue, what are the problems that these people are suffering with and have to live with, and oh my god, let's figure out what the etiopathology is. Meanwhile, we have people dying in front of us. My clinical practice is soldiers and veterans who have been in the combat theater, have suffered these injuries, and are looking for ways to make their lives better. And by the way, they don't go to you. There's a whole set of other alternative universe. And a, you may have remember from 2012, Nick Kristof wrote a great article, I was quoted in it as well, on a major Ben Richards. Ben was severely injured over time in Ramadi. He is going to host a conference in the end of September of all the alternative treatments, none of which I think have been talked about here. Because he and his colleagues, his fellow soldiers and Marines, are looking for what they need to do so they can just live day to day and not have wake up another morning and ask themselves, should I kill myself today? I am 40 years old, and I don't see daylight. And there are others. I'm going to give you a spoiler alert, but you should probably look in the next couple months. You'll see an article in the New York Times about a whole different group of people that are also have suffered, been victims of trauma of this kind, and are looking to have their story told and get some help. So Dallas just reminded me uh, about the gap, the differential in funding between Alzheimer's and TBI. I think it was about 2012, as I was uh, an advisor to Admiral Mullen. It came out, there was, um, I forget, one of the senators, a uh, big campaign. We were going to do a lot of funding in Alzheimer's, big thing. And so I was writing op-eds for The Hill, and I wrote an op-ed called Agent Orange Deja Vu, because that's what we have. My colleagues are all dying, many of them probably of the consequences of Agent Orange. And we have to ask ourselves, in addition to what we're doing here, in addition to everything that we've invested in and is and is truly organic to our DNA as dedicated physicians and scientists, is there something else we also need to do in parallel to jumpstart to help these people live out their lives? Because my best guess, you could tell me if I'm wrong, of the 2.8 million, probably 40% went on combat patrols that were exposed to IEDs. That's a million people. Half of them probably were in proximity, 25 meters or so. That's 500,000. And what do you want to give? 250,000 of them probably felt the impact. That's 250,000 of these young folks who are now living with these problems. They touched three or four lives. So that's a million people out of our population. I know that's not much. It's only 330 million. In our, in our population, and millions not that we don't need to worry about it. We've got other things to do. But we've sent these people in harm's way to defend our liberty, to have the democracy that we all believe in so we can come together and do what we need to do. We need to also think about how we can make their lives better in addition to what you're doing. 
So that's what I'm here to do. I'm going to make your life pretty tough today. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. And you also represent a company that's trying to make a difference. And where I do, I have a couple. <laughs> I have a couple groups. I've formed this nonprofit after Mike left uh, the, um, the chairman's job to find what might be treatments that could be customized and modified quickly to be used uh, with it to help these patients. One of them is Fisher Wallace. We have a CES device that. And a lot of the patients like to use it. You know, it's typical clinical medicine. It may not be right for everybody, but you know, the doctor says, yeah, this might be right for you. Let's see how it works. It's empirical, it's observational. We're all here to try and do the best thing. And there's others as well. So Thank you. Bill. Okay. Uh, I'm William Cornick. I'm the CEO at Astrocyte Pharmaceuticals. Well, and we're a, a small startup of uh, over four years based out of Boston. And we have a small molecule neuroprotectant oh, for the acute treatment of traumatic brain injury and for stroke. And so we've been in probably about a dozen uh, rodent models, uh, kind of mild to severe TBI, blunt TBI, blast TBI, uh, open skull, closed skull. Uh, but now we've also done a uh, pig model, gerencephalic model with the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, in our stroke work, we've done a primate study as well that's been successful. So I think we're moving forward uh, really well. We're in our preclinical stage and hope to be in uh, our phase one studies in 2020. So I think I'm here as a little bit of an industry perspective and an acute treatment perspective and uh, having come through the challenges of a uh, multiplicity of preclinical models that exist and at the doorstep of looking at what the best way to design a, an acute clinical trial will be for trauma patients. Thank you. Rosina. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Rosina Samadani. I am the CEO of Oculogica. We are an eye tracking based technology. And we just received on December 28th, so about <coughs> six months ago, a, an FDA authorization as an aid in diagnosis of concussion. We are the second uh, to have received that particular label and the first um, that is baseline free. And if Ron is a pioneer, we are, uh, I guess we would be classified as the upstart uh, because we've only been around five years and uh, we have not yet uh, benefited from any DOD funding. We're looking forward to that in the future, hopefully. Um, and. Uh, it's an honor to be a part of this panel. I think that it's um, a hallmark of our times that we can actually bring people together that have made it through the FDA process because it has not happened uh, for such a long time. And in order to develop therapies, we need to be able to classify brain injury. And the only way to do that is to have diagnostics that uh, have been validated. Thank you. Michael? Hi, everybody. I'm Michael Singer. Um, I'm the CEO of BrainScope. Magali and I were talking. It's like a, an annual uh, ritual now um, for for us to talk about um, for us to talk about this. Um, and so my I've been at Brainscope for over ten years. Uh, started working out of my house, um, and over the years we've been uh, working with FDA and DoD and all the various groups that you would uh, consider to bring a product to market. Uh, we've done that through um, very substantial um, FDA studies. Our core science uh, begins with uh, EEG, uh, but we um, are very focused on multimodality and multi-parameter assessment uh, as well. Um, what we have done in particular with the regulatory side is we have um, uh, conducted studies and have then gone to FDA we started with a de novo and then it built off of, off of uh, the de novo process. Uh, so we have uh, now have seven FDA clearances. Um, we obviously uh, continue to, to, pursue, uh, to, to pursue more. I'd say that um, I was really struck, General, by your commentary about, um, um, about the action orientation. Um, and um, I'm, I'm a, uh, violently uh, in favor of entrepreneurialism to help uh, kickstart um, bringing products to market. That's, what, that's the American spirit. Um, I was having lunch with my 21-year-old son um, who's graduating from college uh, in a week. And um, we were having sort of a heart-to-heart. -heart, and um, I was telling him how proud I was of him, which is the truth. 
and we were talking, and, and, and um, I said, you know, you weren't the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, far from it. And he said, Brainscope. And I said, yeah, Brainscope. Mm -hmm. And it was, it's pioneering, it's entrepreneurialism, and it begins with all the clinical studies and technology and all of that. I think what's interesting is people don't realize that um, uh, getting an FDA clearance is a little bit like an IPO. It's not the end of the road, it's the beginning of the road. Um, and um, investors very, very clearly recognize that. We've raised um, about $75 million in private funding and we've received about $30 million from, uh, from DOD. Um, and it has been um, incredibly difficult, um, yet at the same time incredibly inspiring. Uh, yesterday I was at Fort Sam Houston, uh, up and back trip, um, and you know, it just made it all worthwhile. And I'd like to echo as well, I mean, without DOD Dallas, we, we wouldn't be here yeah. um, for certain. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so to start the dialogue, I, I was uh, noting in Michael's slides um, earlier that he mentioned um, that we don't have a gold uh, standard for diagnosis and we don't have a, a, a for reference diagnosis for your uh, different programs um, and we don't have a gold standard outcomes approach. Um, you know, so go, <laughs> go develop a way now. Um, and so those are obviously the two biggest challenges. And then you've just uh, outlined a third, which is funding. Mm -hmm. Among those three, which has been the most challenging for your organization? Not having the gold standard, not having funding, or does it all tie together? Well, let me, let me uh, throw the bomb out here. I, I think it's important. Uh, obviously, it's fundamental to medicine that uh, we have a diagnosis and we have a standard for making that diagnosis. And, I, and um, we would proceed accordingly uh, and the scientists and uh, clinical researchers to do that. But I, th I do think when it comes to treatments, the problems that are most impairing and I, from the conversation that we need to think about are headaches and sleep and concentration. And those are ir because the soldiers, and it may be also the athletes, and, I've, and I say that from a personal experience. I had a daughter who played college soccer uh, who may have had some ADHD. Her mother died when she was 13. A lot of factors there. She had some problems as we were going through. Her issues were, hey, Dad, I got to do my schoolwork. I can't think. I can't sleep. The soldiers can't sleep. We have not approached it knowing that there's a syndrome here. All these soldiers have TBI. They have some emotional problem, PTSD, depression, or anxiety. They have chronic pain. We've completely disrupted their sleep cycle in the way that we've trained them both in CONUS and when we've deployed them, and they've been exposed to environmental factors. Now what do we do and what do we find that is the best way to get them on a regular sleep cycle? How do we promote those treatments? So understand from the FDA perspective and what you all do as entrepreneurs, you need a, a clear and accepted nosology here. You need that. From the clinician standpoint, I just need to help this, this young man get his life going. And we need a whole other set of enterprises and activities that, uh, that do that as well. Yeah, let me, let me take a shot at, at, uh, at the question. Um, uh, years ago when we were um, talking with FDA about the gold standard, um, we spent a year and a half going back and forth on the, on the gold standard. This is years ago. And we resolved on, on CT at the time um, because that was, that was it. Um, and years ago, when I was raising money, um, uh, in the background was FDA clearance um, and the like. And so there wasn't as much um, on the gold standard back then um, it was more about how long is this going to take 
more than it was uh, working out the gold standard. I would say that today for um, entrepreneurial companies, by far the biggest problem is the overhang that investors have seen with what we call the, you know, the, the death march or the whatever, you know, whatever morbid term you want to use of all the companies that have died in the space. Um, and you can't just put it on uh, one thing because it's not just FDA. Um, it's not just the gold standard. Uh, you get into reimbursement. You get into uh, clinical adoption. I mean, I'll, we'll present, we'll have, we have 28 peer-reviewed publications over the last many years, and there will be five clinicians that will argue that our papers are not X, Y, or, or Z for that reason, or there's not appropriate reimbursement, or this or that. So the answer to your question is funding. That's the bottom line. Um, if you have enough funding, you can weather it. But to get the funding, um, and I'm, I mean, I'm a financial backgrounded person, is close to impossible. Um, and it has taken um, every ounce of energy, and I imagine our, my fellow panelists will, will, say the, uh, will say the exact same thing. And it's because of the skepticism about how long it takes. It's not just in TBI, but TBI has the reputation of being a death march. It has that reputation in the VC community. I have probably talked to, when I say 300 VCs, that may be shy of how many I have talked to. And I think I've probably raised as much money as, as anybody in the space. And so that's, that's your biggest hurdle. Um, it's for people to understand. And what I joke with as we sell a product, there's the Gazintas and the Gazaldas. When I, when I would talk to um, uh, researchers, they want to be paid. And for us, we want to make money so that we can continue our R&D. And because of that, um, it's, it's, a, it, it, it's a very expensive proposition. So if you can raise enough venture capital to get through all of those hurdles, then you have a shot. Bali, can, that's yes. a very interesting point. And, and it, back to the um, opening remarks by Mr. Murray. Um, if that's the case, and I've heard that, mm -hmm. um, that you, know, you all now have this shadow hanging, you all in the space of trying to raise money for this problem, and, and we have a public health problem as both military veterans and uh, um, as, you know, just from the, those of us with, with uh, sports, then how do we, uh, th then there may be some flawed, I'd ask you who really do, I, I do get involved in the Congress. They do think that, well, all this can be handled by the private sector, right? right? There's an implicit message, right? We're a great capitalist society. We're going we're gonna to continue to thrive. It can be handled by the private sector. But what you're saying is it won't be, it can't be, or it's going to be very, very difficult. And does that mean we have a, need to have a different campaign to explain that to our congressmen and senators, a different message? because we did send these people to war. So follow up on the general's comments. I, I completely endorse him. Uh, I, I've invoked a, an acronym on occasion rather than DOD, COD, Child of Dallas, because uh, <laughs> a lot of the field has benefited <clears throat> from his vision. That's right. A absent that vision now, the field is, is suffering, frankly. And uh, in my terms, uh, data are the capital of science. But we're caught, as Michael pointed out, in a catch-22. We don't have the funds to get the data, to get the capital. And, and, it be, and what I see, of course, I'm driven by Samuel John, my age, Samuel Johnson's great observation that nothing's more purifying than, to the mind than being hung at dawn. <laughs> So I, I look to the short-term uh, benefits as, as you do, General. And I think we have an opportunity here, and I'd like to see this addressed in the breakout sessions, and as, as you've admonished us, there are some real short-term opportunities that can, my aesthetic now is less research 
than changing medical practice in the short term. And I began my career quite the opposite. There are, and given the regulatory theme of, of this discussion, let me simply point out two opportunities that relate to the original question of how do we cross-validate biomarkers? Mm -hmm. And if we go back to what Michael pointed out, uh, the, the CT scan, which clearly has the weight of uh, history and objectivity on its side. The CT scan now has uh, AI-driven technology behind it, supported by a number of uh, people uh, and companies, Icometrics or one. I've mentioned this in our breakout session. And uh, cross-validating the, and, and that, uh, that technology is now FDA cleared. It hasn't been mentioned here, but it is FDA cleared. And we have a number of people here who have FDA cleared diagnostic technology. I think an emphasis on the cross-validation of existing FDA cleared technology and diagnostics is a very short path towards val validation and securing the confidence that we need, not only from investors, but it, it, when we go to the DOD or to the Hill, is what, what I, I would prefer, that we have a compelling case. And, and I, I think that's the, the short-term short goal that uh, I'd like to follow up on uh, more Great. in this, that's if you tangible. agree. Jim. I agree, I think that's yeah. exactly it. We have one voice, yeah. No, Bill? I yeah. think Ron's on the right path there because there's, Clearly, the industry and the investment community knows there's a huge opportunity here. Wherever there's a huge unmet need, there's a huge opportunity. But they're on the sidelines because they don't see a path forward or a path through. So I think that's where this conference of things can really help, is kind of highlighting what is that path that has credibility, what are the biomarkers, what is that clinical trial that's possible that allows you to get through to the other side. I think in the venture community, there's 29 billion invested in life science companies in 2018. And there is 71 billion plus in the pharma companies. So it's over $100 billion all designed to be going towards therapeutic and device innovation and in life sciences that's on the sidelines almost completely in this space. Yeah. And they want to be you know, pursuing opportunities, filling that unmet need, and making money on this space, but they don't see a path. So that skepticism hangover is still there. And as long as we can, we can start showing more optimism that we've had some progress, that there is a path forward. It's not the whole elephant in front of us. We, 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 we've made a lot of progress. We have some approvals, and there's clear steps in the next two years that'll get us even farther. That'll start to realize that we're, this area is making progress, and there's opportunity, and there's a path. So the problem isn't in our stars, it's in ourselves. And so the path exists, and it's incumbent upon us at this meeting and going forward to articulate that path. I have a having suffered at the uh, interrogations of uh, venture capitalists. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, they're not stupid people. And they ask, the right, <laughs> you know, they ask the right questions. So, uh, and they deserve the right answers. Okay. And I think there's been a lot of demonization of, of uh, entities, including the DOD, uh, uh, of, of not, you know, sort of getting it. Well. We, that's our problem. We, we, most of these people are extremely well-intentioned. I had the good fortune through Dallas of working with Pete Corelli and, and, and during his tenure. You know, the intentions are there and there's no more finely honed motive and ethic than the DOD has provided. And I, I'm confident that that will resonate with the DOD if we do our job to present it. Rosina? So I would say, going back to your original question, which is more important, it's obviously they're both related to each other. And on the clinical reference standard, there's an internal clinical reference standard, and then there's the one that you absolutely go and must agree upon with FDA. From a, an investment perspective, you definitely need grants and DOD funding and all of that, but if you can't convince an external investor, it is most likely because you don't have a business model. You don't have a way to make money because these guys aren't stupid. And they see lots of companies get to this point and then face a valley of death. And we're 
facing that right now. We've gotten through the authorization, and now we need to get to right before that hockey curve. And that, what that means to the hockey stick is that, you know, that increase in revenues. That means that we need to have reimbursement in place. There needs to be a clinical implication of our diagnostic. Otherwise, it really doesn't matter to the VC, and the VC represents a capitalistic society. I mean, they're not, uh, they're not really interested in anything else. Uh, and so it's going to be both of these things. It's going to be DOD and all of the other NIH, all of the other funding entities to help us get through to that other side. Uh, and then the VCs will come in and meet us. Um, from, a, from an overall VC perspective, yes, there's a huge amount of money in life sciences. About a third of that is for medical devices. And the reason for that is that medical devices have not had the exits that the other sectors within life sciences have had. And so you, you really just need to think about, OK, what's realistic um, in, the, in the medical device arena? General. Um, so taking off on both comments, and I really like your, because in terms of focusing on us, right? I mean, if you're going to win a tennis match, it's in your head. And I'm a big fan of Roland Garros here. Uh, we need to, amongst ourselves, find a way to have a coherent voice for respective audiences. So we may have a voice for venture capitalists. And you all are very expert at that. And I've failed every time I've even tried to take a step in that world. Um, <laughs> But we also need to have a voice for the people right now, and that's our legislators, who, if we're going to do something for this problem, this public health problem, we need to get them on board. And that means we ourselves have to start those conversations and agree of how we're going to do that and swallow hard at times of what are, is most important and uh, be able to align ourselves because, because we share those values and objectives. So I think you're on target. So what would each of you ask for? If you're in front of Congress, and they're standing right here in front of you, what are we asking for? I think we start with what is a game plan. We have a problem. Let's look and see how we can take what we have. It's the translational part of this. And let's see what we can do and, and bring those together in a way that we can configure what is a reasonable set of treatments and interventions for these people. And then we have a second path of what we need to do to fund what, what, what might be in the long term better diagnostics and better treatments. And I think we have to explain it very clearly. Spot on. One page white paper, something yeah. like that. Yeah. So, so Big crayons. They, they need to be very, very concrete asks. Absolutely. Uh, and, and that's our experience. You're saying because you talk about we need the science and the research, and it just doesn't land. Um, what do you want? What do we want? Do we want to fund? Do we want DOD, VA, some other funding source for, to jumpstart, to seed capital, to get past that first hurdle? Do we need funding to support an absolute clear diagnostic uh, reference, gold standard? What do you need? Well, I think to follow up on the general's comments, uh, that all of those questions are essential. I think they uh, don't lend themselves to a, a, a discussion today, the detail that they demand. Sure. And as you just, uh, of course, pointed out, you really need to show up on a hill uh, with big crayons and a very explicit pathway because the, you're, you're gonna, the staff members are ultimately going to carry the ball. They're gonna, they, they don't want to figure this out. They want to know where the money's going to land. Want a Is it going to land in the DOD? Is it going to land in the VA? Who's, gonna, who's going to uh, be responsible for receiving and dispersing that money? And that it's not, you know, and the, the horrible word now, earmark or anything, that it represents a programmatic effort. I think that CVB, is, is, is a, as an honest broker, is an ideal, um, uh, you know, mediator of this process. And I'd like 
uh, the coalition can certainly help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I, and I think the, to, the ask. For, yeah. for, because you, you know you're you're not uh, conflicted in this area. But I I, I don't pretend to have complete uh, knowledge of this. I would certainly want to follow the generals and others' advice on how we do this. But I would I would not table this, but put create this, a working group. Create a working group to move this forward. Is that something you would think uh, would help us? I, 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 I'm asking. Uh, the, yeah, yeah, you're, they're on board. <laughs> yeah. Dallas, I think you could contribute to that, certainly. Well, it's got the scars to show it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> certainly, it seems as if the funding for this area has fallen uh, and has declined um, in the Department of Defense. And I don't know if that's because Colonel Hack has left and he's retired or if it's because the return on investment to date has not been fantastic and they're concerned about that, or it's because other priorities have risen. So I'd really like to understand that a little bit more uh, before we um, you know, uh, sort of Mark charge off. forward. I do think a working group would be phenomenal. It would be helpful to understand what's happened in the past uh, because those are the types of things that I have heard uh, and I'm you know, fairly new to this game. I've been around for five years in this industry. Uh, but if I've heard it, I'm sure that somebody else has heard it as well. Um, we all want more funding. Yes, of course. That's what everybody in this room is trying to get. But throwing that up against the wall and just hoping it sticks is not a great plan. Well, I, certainly you, you want more funding, but uh, I'll betray uh, well, my romanticism in this. If we forget our constituency or we turn aside from the goals that uh, the general has admonished us to uh, achieve, we're going to fail. And nothing will succeed more than authenticity when we present our case. And what uh, all of us here are... Uh, the fortunate few. And none of us are here out of cynicism or only a desire for money. And uh, certainly we need the money, but I don't, I, I would remind us that that's not why we're going forward. Yeah, that's a very important point. I would agree with that. <laughs> So um, I'd like to open it up to the audience for a few minutes. Uh, any questions for the panel? You've heard the discussion and, um, of course, the, the imploration uh, from General Zanakis that we need to do something. So uh, there's a mic heading your way. Thanks. I, I really enjoyed the presentation today. But I have to respond to what the general said and the challenges. One of the things that we, I was a former VP for research at two universities, so I understand, and I worked on the Bayh-Dole Act back many, many years ago, so I understand the importance of venture capitalism and the importance of heavy investment in technology. But one of the things, general, I think that we're seriously overlooking in this approach, we heard the other day that lifestyle changes nutrition, all these other factors play a major role, but we're not really investing in any of this alternative approaches. It's all based on the highest technology, the costliest approaches, and I understand the reasons for that. And my university is heavily engaged in that. But, you know, we talk about the, how China steals our ideas. Maybe we ought to go and steal some of their ideas because, you know, they're investing a huge amount of money in creating an entire city outside of Qingdao to look at alternative medicine. And they understand very well, I was there consulting to this, they understand very well the, va the value and virtues of allopathic medicine and of all the technologies and high technology techniques, but they also recognize they have a 6,000 year old culture that's managed to produce a couple billion people that survive. And they're saying, why not also look at these alternative medicines? You could invest the cost of one Abrams tank and have enough to fund the, the Center for Alternative Medicine at NIH for probably three years. That's how little is going into this approach. And I think realistically, while I'm all in favor of the developments that you're talking about here, if you really want to make some progress in a way that gets to what your patients, what you mentioned earlier, why not put a small investment into some of these alternative approaches that other countries are using 
Ayurvedic medicine is one. The acupuncture is another. God knows all the other traditional types of, 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 of approaches that are used in these other cultures like China and, and Southeast Asia. Why not look at some of these? Does it all have to be the most expensive approach? I'd like you guys to address some of these uh, critical questions. Well, I mean, I've, I, I'm really glad you put, brought that up because I do think it also fits to what you're saying and what we've been saying. Um, I think you're absolutely right because when both in terms of this other community that uh, is now of, uh, that I was telling you about where Major Richards is yeah. convening this meeting, but also many of my patients do exactly what you're saying. Uh, in terms of what really benefits them are all that whole universe of so-called complementary and alternative medical approaches, diet and exercise and life, all the things that Buddy says, well, we don't have an RCT to show that they're really effective, but these people experience them as having a benefit. What, what the challenge in part is, I do think right now that's how we would configure effective treatment and support, is in that, that in, in that sphere with these folks. We cannot get them funded. We cannot build clinics around them. We, the people that are trying to do it can't get paid unless we go about and advocate to do, this is what we've got, this is the bird in the hand. This is what we've got now. In it, and then as a parallel, we will do the development that we're doing here. I think you're 100% right. And Don, I, you and I have discussed this independently, and, and again, uh, as the general points out, this is an area that can be included in the working group's discussions on the ask, and, and I, I strongly endorse that. Uh, there's a, a Dale Bredesen's work at uh, uh, in his institute is, uh, you know, in Alzheimer's disease, any chronic disease whether it's diabetes or cardiovascular disease or PTSD uh, will, or AD, dementias, is going to benefit in the shorter term from wellness regimens. And, and these are very cheap and, and easily implementable. I think a, a, an important agenda for the working group would be to identify that and to provide <clears throat> some nidus of support for right. that. But that's, we, can, we can discuss that. Uh, and, uh, Certainly welcome input from anyone. On the so for the, the clinical trial domain that uh, all three of us were in yesterday, I mean, this was definitely an area where there's a lot of consensus and David Brody's model is a good way to you know, bring this forward to have multiple trials. And you can, you can see there's probably not 30 kind of innovative medicines. There's a lot of alternative treatments if you're gonna try and do 30 treatments in a, a 10 years as, as David proposed. Uh, but I would highlight, um, I think there's a lot of us, a lot of people that deal with the chronic side and that's where the biggest burden is of, of trauma. But there's also the acute side as well, and there's a, we have to keep that opportunity in mind as well, because if we are able to make advances there, we'll lower the burden overall in the future. So I just want to make sure our recommendations end up addressing both acute and chronic treatments of, of, of the patients. Sure. Absolutely. Sure. Right. Any other questions, uh, Stuart? I agree with what the comment was just made. Um, what is helpful a lot of times is not doesn't treat the condition, but makes the, the person feel better. Um, I, I spent a short time at a, at a uh, rehab site up in Pennsylvania, it was associated with the DOD, um, and I was in charge of, of putting together a research program, and, and it involved different modules. One of them was a therapeutic massage module. It was happened to be uh, performed, it was done by a retired Marine in the, in the state of Pennsylvania, who was actually on the state licensing board for therapeutic massage. That was the best, that was the most well-received treatment that they got there in that, in that program. Why? Because TBI is a socially isolating condition and they felt isolated. And here was someone who was a Marine, he was Army, that was okay, it was Air Force, maybe not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I'm saying that's, that, was, that was a comment from, from, one of the, uh, from one of the people, one of the clients in the program. So, it, it, yes, there's things that make you feel better. It's not necessarily one of the treatments, but it improves their quality of life and makes them feel better. So there needs to be some sort of, you know... Um, Holistic it, approach. It, yeah, yeah there, there is separation between what is actually the treatment for their brain injury as opposed to what is making them 
uh, be more able to deal with life on a day-to-day -day basis. Go ahead. Yeah, it'll start. I'm actually going to uh, argue with that perspective. There is pharmacology to therapeutic massage. In fact, what's been shown is that it activates the endocannabinoid system. So that in itself, and by the way, is incredibly neuroprotective. There's a mountain of data on the protective effects of the endocannabinoid system. Mm. So just because something makes somebody feel better and we can't see the pharmacological, physiological changes yet, doesn't mean that it's not pharmacological or physiological. We have really limited science to blunt tools until recently, and they'll probably say that in 20 years again, but um, our ability to see under the, the light post is good, but we can't see what's in the dark. And I suggest to you that that's a lot of what neuroscience is right now. We talked about dark data yesterday, which I thought was an entertaining term, but um, there's dark pharmacology as well that we still aren't aware of. And so I come from that community, <clears throat> that, that community of supposed alternatives. Um, ha having spent a bunch of time at NIH as a postdoc, I found that people were incredibly open to ideas like systems biology and even network pharmacology. But the second you mentioned a medicinal plant or a nutraceutical, it was over. Their minds snapped shut like a steel trap. So I'd like to challenge this community to know that there's more to pharmacology than just synthetics and that significant differences have been made, um, especially if you look at traditional medicines, and there's more and more data coming out on uh, validating the pharmacology of traditional medicine. So i just like to put that out there. Well said. And um, I, I wanted to mention also yesterday at dinner um, for the I was sitting next to a gentleman who represents a veteran service organization as a veteran himself, has been listening to our conversation and our communication and uh, communicated to me how profoundly, uh, on the one hand, disturbed he was that we are all just wedded to the model of, sci of medicine and science as we have practiced it all this time. And that from his perspective, there and from his, his friends and, and, and peers, um, that they're, they're not thinking that what we think is the priority is the priority. So I'm asking, where do we get that, that voice into this process? Where do we get the patient centricity uh, in, into this as well? Uh, so that, that's my two cents and feedback from, from that gentleman, who will remain nameless. <laughs> um, uh, we have uh, three minutes. I'd like to just go down the line and, and um, just a final thought. Uh, so where, where you think we should go next uh, based on this, this very, very interesting conversation today? The working group. Working group. Okay. I endorse that. I'm saluted. Two. Very good. A working group that gives us a clinical path both on acute and chronic. Okay. So uh, I'll jump on the bandwagon with the working group, but I would say let's go forward in a different way than we have been in the past. I don't want to just pile on. Um, I think, nice um, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. I, th I think that um, uh, one of the things that, as we look at practical approaches as to how we're going to help patients, um, I, I think that understanding the entirety of what it takes to get a technology adopted broadly is something that I think the, the entire community needs to understand. An, an academic community may, may say, I just want to know the science. And the VC community says, I just want to know what are the returns, the hockey stick, whatever. But to understand it all together, that entire process, so that there's, there becomes that epiphany of what it takes is something that I think is really important for traumatic brain injury, just like any other disease state. And until that happens, people are going to be, unfortunately, I think, in their own, their own little, their own worlds. And if we can bring all of that together. So as an example, you're running as a, as a company and you, you've now gotten your FDA clearance, and then you find, and you know, there's celebration and all of that, and then you say, okay, now I gotta sell this stuff. Or first I have to make this stuff. And it's going to have to be the certain amount of cost. And how can, I get it, how can I get it paid and all of that? 
understanding that entirety is where I think this, this whole area needs to go in order to truly propel it. That's entire, my view. Entire the system. entirety of it, not just the science. It's right. not just the economic side. It's the all of it together. And understanding the practicalities around it and understanding you, know, you have to have a business model. Scientists don't understand that, you, and, and I'm not saying scientists are, don't understand that you need a business model. Of course they do. But what does that mean? What does it take? What does it take? Yeah. And Michael, you get the final word. Yeah, it's free. No, I'll start. No, but I will start the, uh, I'll end, kind of start with where I started, or go with where I started before. I think interaction with, you know, we're, the, the famed, uh, I can't remember who coined it, like, we're from the government, we're here to help. Those are like <laughs> the words that nobody likes to hear, but it really does. Nobody likes to hear that, but it really is true. I can, I can vouch for everybody in my, you know, in our building, in our campus. That really is what they want to do. So, I, you know, they understand that there is a need. They understand that it's a very significant patient population. They want to do what they can to help. There are other tools that I haven't hit on. Um, there are device development tools, drug development tools that are basically geared at trying to make trials easier. And there are other pathways that we have in order to bring payers into those early discussions with FDA too, so that you can actually start some of those discussions early rather than after you get a clearance. So you can start getting that whole picture that you may not get otherwise, or you may do it in, delay, in a delayed fashion. Because if you're gonna do, collect information for a marketing submission, you may as well find something that can satisfy what the pairs are looking for, too. So there are other tools that are trying to be developed on our end as well to try and look at that whole life cycle. Um, and I think just exploring those can be very helpful. Thank you. And thank you to the entire panel. Very interesting discussion. Thank you, Magali. Thank you. Thank you guys.